Welcome to A Double, Double, and Dice, with your host Kim, and Jocelyn. Pour your favorite beverage, pull up a comfy chair, because we are ready to roll. Welcome to episode 60 of A Double, Double, and Dice, and today we're going to continue on our meta talk, because we got some, well, quite some feedback about it, Um, and then we'll see how our guesses was there our guesses our predictions, predictions uh, fell in the actual analysis of uh, all the teams that came in for two team takedown so and Jocelyn has no idea so this is gonna be a good uh, a good one a good surprise for her none whatsoever because I can guarantee you I did not look at 64 teams to determine <laughs> how well we did or not uh, if someone did that I don't know what to say. <laughs> I also don't know how to program to do fancy things with bots. So yeah, yeah, none of those things I am good at. So I'm sure that if I learned them, if someone taught me, I could probably figure it out. But I'm not good at those things today and I don't have time to look at 64 teams. So I am going to depend on the research that you have, Kim. Yeah, so um, Nick did all the research. So, you know, I'm pretty sure it uh, it was done right. (laughs) Okay, so all the kudos go to Jackalope Spam today. Yeah, yeah. And he had quite of a conversation because we're going to dive into the dice bag first. Well, and I think we'll get to our predictions. Before we dive into the dice bag, Kim, I'm going to throw a curveball your way. Okay. Because uh, you might have heard a rumor that the rules forum has reactivated. I've heard that rumor. And not to like pat myself on the back or anything, but the first question that was answered from the rules forum was mine. (laughs) So I put a bunch of questions into the rules forum. So if you're not familiar with the rules forum, um, Dice Masters has a rules question or a rules forum on the WizKids website. It's win.wizkids.com and then a bunch of things that get you to the rules forum. So if you just go into Google and type in (laughs) Dice Masters rules forum, it's your first link. Okay. And we so, will link it in the show notes. Don't worry. Because Kim's awesome that way. <laughs> so um, for context, prior to these questions being answered, which happened after our last episode was recorded before it dropped. Okay. Um, the previous glass question was answered on June 15th, 2020. Okay. Mm-hmm. So... <laughs> on Saturday, April 23rd, I posted a question and um, it was answered on Monday, May 2nd. So after our podcast came out. So I put a bunch of questions into the rules forum and this is the first one that was, was answered. So I had asked them if they could update the compatibility word- wording because in WWE, which came out in 2019... Um, they changed the word for character. Do you know what that character word is in WWE, Kim? Superstar die? That's right. Superstar? Yeah. So on this rules forum thing, they have a compatibility wording so that if you're a newer player and you're not sure, like, what is Superstar or what is the difference between monster in Yu-Gi-Oh! and monster in D&D, they have the compatibility wording. So I asked them if they would update the compatibility wording to include Superstar. And that was the first question they answered. Um, After that, they answered another question that I asked, uh, which I was really surprised, to be honest, that they answered this one because it it is covered in the rule book. However, there's a lot of, what's the right word? Discourse? disagreement arguments all of those things work Um, constructive discussion around out of play versus the use pile in the context of your own player's turn so kim you know exactly what i'm talking about right uh sure so there is basic rules text in the rule book that says hard text supersedes rules text Right? Hard text, did you say? Card text. Oh, card text, yes. Yes, which I'm fully in agreement that card text should oversee, you know, the rule book, but go on. Right, so sometimes there are cards that 
contradict the rules and cards mm -hmm. overrule the rules. But there is also something in the rule book that's called the fundamental rules. And it says that anything that sends a die to the use pile on card text will send the card, send the die out of play if it is the active player's turn. So these two things kind of conflict with one, of, one another. So there's a, a group of folks that feel that because the card says go to the use pile and card text supersedes rules text, that the die should go directly to the use pile, even though the fundamental rule of the game says if this sends it to the use pile on your own turn, it goes to out of play. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Okay. So WizKids has confirmed through this question that dice sent to their owner's use pile during that player's turn generally still go out of play, even if a card says it would send that die to the use pile. So, um, so that hopefully will put to bed that argument about out of play versus the use pile. So I'm really glad that WizKids answered that question. I'd like it if they answered the other questions that I'm putting in. So, <laughs> hey, Jimmy, if you're listening or folks that are on the rules forum, there were several other questions that I submitted about Dark Phoenix cards. Um, that would be great. But in the meantime, those two questions were answered in May. And then followed that, uh, there was a question from Jackalope Spam, previously mentioned, um, about Awaken. There's a die uh, in, I think it's in Infinity Gauntlet. No, Avengers no, Infinity Campaign uh, Box. It's Justice Like No, Justice Like Lightning Team Pack. That's the one. That's exactly yeah. what I said. The Justice Like Lightning Team Pack, Kim. Ant Man Penny Th Petty Theft that says Ant Man is unblockable until end of turn when he is spun up uh, is the Awaken effect. So he wanted to know if that meant that all Ant Men would be unblockable when one of them spins up or just the one that spins up. And the answer was that just the one that spins up is the one that's unblockable. So there you go. The WizKids Rules Forum has awoken. And, and then, then gone I checked it actually today and nothing's been answered since. So <laughs> No, nothing's been answered since. However, they answered three questions on Monday, May 2nd. Mm -hmm. So we will take it. Yeah. So anyway, um, the reason I bring that up is because first off, that use pile versus out of play thing I'm very proud of. <laughs> and second <laughs> off is when Jackalope Spam sent me the feedback. He started with, congratulations on the first rules forum answer in the past two years. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so that's, uh, that's where we started. But anyway, he started to provide feedback about episode 59, where we talked about the meta talk. And he said that he really enjoyed all of our rundowns of the meta cards we expected to see. So he did some analysis, which Kim has alluded to, that we're going to talk about shortly. Um, but he did say that many of the card callouts that we shared were spot on, and some that we thought that would be prevalent were not used a lot. Very shockingly in some cases. Very few Iceman and Green Lanterns. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so that was uh, something interesting. So he enjoyed that talk. So that was great. Now, in that episode, I also shared a definition that I had found for the word meta because, you know, I don't really know what that means or what the context is. And, and Kim, you weren't sure either. We say meta a lot, but we don't always maybe know what to define it as. So Nick talked about something called not just the meta, but the meta game. So... Have you heard of this concept, Kim? No. Okay. So he said, consider it like the rock, paper, scissors aspect of competitive play. He says, in some games, there might be a few dominant strategies, but each wins to some and loses to others. So you need to get a read on the meta to see what's going to be popular and then pick the strategy that has a favorable outcome against it. So, for example, if Team A is popular, I'll play Team B since it has a good ch chance of beating the Team A, even if Team B doesn't win as often against Team C or Team D or Team E, right? So you just hope to see mostly Team A. Okay. He, says I don't, he says he doesn't think that Dice Masters always boils down to such tactics like this because um, 
you know, there's, there's different variations. He said, instead, this is where you see most people talk about the flex spots. You've made a strong team. You've filled it with a win condition, support, ramp, and basic control, but you have a spot or two left, hopefully. So in addition to your basic control, something like a typhoid Mary, red rubber boots that should work against almost everything that your opponent has, what can you bring that is sp the specific hamper to that team A? And he brought up 2019 Worlds. And we've talked about 2019 Worlds um, in the past, Kim, but maybe not in this context. So in the 2019 Worlds, everyone thought the big baddie was going to be, do you remember, Kim? Yanti? No, that was 2018. In 2019 was Iceman. Oh, okay. Iceman right on the schedule. Everyone was talking about Iceman. I was talking about Iceman all the time. Back then I was writing regular Out of the Shadows articles because um, we had a regular Iceman. release of product. And it was all about what could beat Iceman. What could put, help you against Iceman. Here's something that might be useful that people aren't talking about. Here's a card that you may, be not, may, have, may not have considered against Iceman. So there was this whole conversation about Iceman being the big baddie. Right? And it was the strongest team at the time. And if you play that team, you know that the rest of the people are gunning for you and making plans to beat your team specifically. Otherwise, you needed a team to beat Iceman while still having a decent chance against the rest of the matchups. So what was interesting about that meta was it was really vast. Although everyone talked about Iceman being the main thing, there weren't as many Iceman teams in the 2019 Worlds competition as we expected. And in the top eight, only two of the teams had Iceman. One of those made it to the top four, but neither made it to the final. So Rob was actually the Iceman top four contender at 2019 Worlds. Um, and uh, and Craig, Craig Pascas, Craig, Craig Hubner, uh, was in the top eight. So the 2019 meta was quite wide. So mm -hmm. that's really interesting. And we'll drop a link in the show notes to the information that we have on the DM-North website about the 2019 Worlds Championship because there's some really great team builds in there that were part of what was going on. And it just showed there was so much talk about Iceman. Everyone prepared to beat Iceman. But then some people brought teams that were not Iceman. Right? And some teams just were not great matchups. So that was really interesting. So that's that's what uh, what Nick shared about the, the meta game. Hmm. So thoughts, Kim? Not really. <laughs> no? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. So we also heard about Meta from our friend Chris Williams over at the Ministry of Dice. Oh, yes. And he okay. shared with us that he also didn't think this was great podcasting necessarily, but I'm going to share it anyway because I think it's interesting. Um, so the term Meta is something from something called game theory that was sort of introduced in the 1940s and was used a great deal for political and economical analysis from around the late 50s onwards. The idea is mostly about using mathematical models built on behavioral interactions and a number of other inputs to make strategic decisions. It really took off, he says, with American anal analysts in the 60s who were using it to play war games with the Cold War and make strategic decisions about Soviet Russia. But I know it from the its application to business models that analyze competitor behavior, customer behavior, and economic climate. So an element of the game theory was called the metagame theory, the mini games within the wider game that create contributing factors. So he gives an example. When a mobile phone provider offer a tariff to new customers that would operate at a loss, this is game theory in action. The cost of acquisition is valued in game theory as higher when considered against the cost of your competitor not retaining the customer. It's often thought that this is just a get you on board and hope that you forget the change, but that's incorrect. The business is playing the competitive metagame. So it's almost like a loss leader, right? You sell something at below cost to get somebody over and then hope that they buy other things is kind of how mm -hmm. I said it. So he said it straight into our world of gaming back in the mid nineties, because Richard Garfield in relation to magic, the gathering applied game theory in a number of articles. And he talks about the strategic decisions players were making in competitive magic he used to talk about how the game interacts itself, 
um, in the terms of the rules and interactions, and we make decisions based on our understanding of the current strategic reality of the game, taking into account the data points that inform how we proceed. So similar, you know, from that, that concept there, right? So you take all of the data you have, you know what people are playing and what people are focused on, and then you make a decision, am I going to play that or am I going to play to play against it? Right? Hmm. I never so, think like that. <laughs> no? I think you no. might think like that because, but you think about it in a different context, Kim, because what you do generally, two team takedown notwithstanding, because you're playing Master Mold. <laughs> <laughs> because you, you told me. Well, when, when else are you going to play, play that card Mold? anyways? <laughs> right? But you look at what everyone's playing, Kim. And then you build something completely different, generally. Generally, yes. And your Master Mold team, like I haven't looked at the other Master Mold teams, but I don't think anyone's using it the same way you are. No. So. Not that have, I've, I haven't looked them up, but I don't think so. Like, you have come up with a, an interesting strategy to clear your opponent's field to ensure that your your Sentinel tokens and your Master Molds get through that, you know, is something that's completely different. So your way of looking at Dice Masters is sort of you look at what everyone else is playing and then you play something different. Even when you're playing those top meta cards like Master Mold what's he called endless sentinels something like that yeah like i i should know right <laughs> well i have your team in front of me actually on my map do you really yeah because i was gonna play it but <laughs> i had a chance to do it yet but it's still here yeah endless sentinels sorry i had all my sentinel tokens on top of it and i had to move them to check um so that's kind of how you do it so you do it even though you don't think you do it you do it in reverse mm. Mm -hmm. You take the data points of what people are playing. You're like, well, I've never played that, so I'm going to do something different. Or I don't want to play what everyone else is playing, so I'm going to do something different. Like I'm going to build strike. my entire competitive <laughs> team on Orbital Strike. Exactly. Right? Except I'm too bad I can't bring... roll tokens. It's a, you know, yeah. couldn't roll tokens. I'm going to bring, um, what'd you say, in 2019, can Nats. You said, I'm going to bring oh, team, team up. Team up, yeah. Right? You brought team up, basic action card, and built a really wide field and overwhelmed your opponent when everyone else was really focused on the Adam, um, Professor, Iceman right on schedule, or the Collector. I don't remember what his subtitle was. The one uh, that you I don't could know, the purchase and die and field psychics. something. Yeah. yeah. The global. No, no, yeah. not field psychics. Um he he was the one where you could purchase a die for two less and field it once per turn. Similar yeah. to the the Golden collector, cards, I forget. Yeah, he's similar to the collector in Infinity Gauntlet, but the Infinity Gauntlet limits it to a three cost or less, and it has to be it can only be once per turn. And you have to do it when you awaken him, so you have to spin him up in the Infinity Gauntlet version. In the previous version, which was from Guardians of the Galaxy, I guess? Yes, I believe so. Um, you could purchase any die as long as you had the cost for it. You had to spend whatever the cost was less two. So if you had a five cost, you could field it for three. And then at the end of the turn, it would go back to the card. So slightly different, but that was the one that was... Oh, Tan, Tan Lear Tivan? Tantalier T. Something, yeah. I, I think, think that was that, yeah, it was name. a rare, right? Yeah. Yeah. That sounds familiar. Yeah. So anyway, so that was sort of the big cards that were being played there. Um but you said, No, I'm gonna play team up. Yeah. <laughs> so you made top eight with team up. Yes, I did. Yeah. All right. So yeah. you know, those those things happen. Um so yeah, that's uh, I miss team up. Come back, team up. <laughs> WizKids, if you're listening, Kim wants Team Up. Don't print Team Up while Superior Spider-Man Super Rare from Infinity Gauntlet oh, is, gosh. <laughs> is legal, please. Personal yeah, that's request. just going to make the team just bad. Superior Spider-Man gains the team affiliations of all of the character cards on your team. 
Yep. And team up says you take all of the active affiliations of all of the dice on your team minus one, and then give your cart your dice all of that a buff. So if you had ten affiliations, all of your dice get plus nine. Mm -hmm. Even your sidekicks. Mm -hmm. Don't print team up while Superior Spider Man is legal. <laughs> Which it's gonna be a while. Probably. So, um, so that is the mailbag. Also, I did want to uh, mention that Chris answered our question about when that um, cover was from. We talked about... Uh, oh, the um, Raven? Yeah. So that was from 1993. So thank you, Chris, for... <laughs> For letting us know. So we were wrong. Didn't we see like, like 70s or 80s or something? Yeah, we said something like that. But maybe it was yeah. like a throwback art. Um, her legs were warm, but I don't know about the rest of her. So. <laughs> but uh, when Raven <laughs> crashes the wedding. Uh, I don't think they got, you know, women's date. clothing back then properly, you know. Well, that's a whole other conversation, Kim. We could yeah, save yeah. that for a different day. <laughs> um, so that is that. There is one other piece of the mailbag that I wanted to share. And this is particularly for our friend at Jordo. <laughs> so I want to first off, thank uh, Jack Lope Spam Nick for doing a little bit of research for us. So one of the things that we talked about when, a couple of episodes ago, when we talked about what's better master mold versus God catcher. And we had a whole discussion about that. And one of the pieces of feedback we received uh, was from Jordo who said, that because God catcher is a trap, he said it feels weird that you trigger your own trap. It mm -hmm. just doesn't feel thematic. Mm -hmm. So Nick did some research for us and he said the walking statues, such as the God catcher are, and, and I'm going to phrase it exactly the way he did. He says are about as much of a trap as the suits of armor from Hogwarts in the last movie. So if you're not familiar with Harry Potter, <laughs> In the last movie, um, Professor McGonagall enchanted all of the suits of armor in the Hogwarts castle to fight Lord Voldemort. Um, so they were activated by an ally, right? I, yes? I think I remember. Okay. That's what happened. But Professor McGonagall is an ally of the suits of armor, right? So... Um, so he says that the walking statues are a city defense that the defender of the city activates rather than the assailant, for example, touching something bad or stepping on a trigger or something like that, like a trap. So they're just much, much bigger. He said, so he supposed that the no he supposes that the notion of con the controlling player springing the God catcher trap is apt compared to that sort of um, canon within D and D and he says perhaps the other God catcher and the great drunkard who is also a walking statue should function similarly <laughs> because they're triggered by a friendly, not a foe. All right. So it's like if your opponent uses an action, then it should kind of like trigger it or something like that. So instead of your opponent triggering it, you trigger it. Are you, you with me? the God catcher or you trigger? Yes, you trigger the God catcher. So the, that's the way the God catcher works. So the way God catcher famous walking statue works is you have one in your field. And then you, as the active player, you use an action die. And that triggers the God catcher token 1010. In D&D &D canon, D&D &D lore, whatever language you want to use, D&D &D storytelling, in the Waterdeep story, that's how God catchers are created. So um, the defender of the city needs help defending the city. So they trigger the God catcher. Are you with me? Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah, so yeah. you, Kim, are in charge of making sure the city of Waterdeep is protected. And it's being assailed by evildoers. So you, Kim, you put your sword in the ground or whatever, you shine the bat signal in the sky or whatever it is you do. <laughs> and the God Catcher famous walking statues are activated to protect the city. So it's you that did it. You didn't spring a trap. You did it on purpose. 
So the way that the God Catcher famous walking statue is triggered in Dice Masters is thematic, but it doesn't sound like a trap. So calling it a trap is maybe a little weird. Mm, okay. So anyway, let us know what you think <laughs> about God Catcher triggering itself and if you are familiar with the Waterdeep lore. Um, and, uh, and that is all we have for the dice bag. Nice. So what's next, Kim? Shall we get to our analysis? Let's do it. All right. So, if you remember, I do which remember. was our last episode, we had one, two, three, four, five, six on the list that we thought was going to be top mana. Okay. Uh, Thor, which is mm -hmm. a super rare Thor. Jormung, Jormung, I don't know how to say that. Your, Jormung, remember, it sounds like a, yeah, it sounds like a Y. Jormung, Jormungan <laughs> Sphere. Yeah. Um, two of I the don't Beckys. even know if I'm saying it right. Yeah. Two of the Beckys, Maiden Ireland and Straight Fire. Mm -hmm. Maiden Ireland is the one that's Overcrush and Reroll. And Straight Fire, I think it's just the Overcrush one. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the Godcatcher, which we just talk, talk, talked about. Uh, Master Mold and Jubilee X-Men Feel Leader, which I believe is a super rare run, correct? That's correct. Okay, in the top 10, ready for it? Because you don't know ready. this. One of those made top 10. Just one? One. I know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shock you today. <laughs> Clearly. One. Do you want to guess which one? Sorry. Sorry, not one. I'm sorry. Two made the top 10. Do you want to guess which two? Sorry, I can't read. So two of them made the top 10 of the 64 teams? That's correct. I'm going to say that we're Becky's... on teams that were on teams. Well, there's 64 teams, right? Yeah. Yeah. 32 players, 64 teams. So they were on top 10 and I'll tell you how much they showed up on teams. Okay. I'm going to say Becky Lynch made in Ireland. Okay. And I'm going to say the God catcher famous walking statue. Okay. So Becky made in Ireland was right. It came out 10th. 13 teams had that. Okay. The second one is incorrect. It was actually Thor. It was number okay. five on the list. And 15 teams have that on their team. Wow. Yes. I mean, so, I thought uh, Thor would be pretty high, but I thought people would go Godcatcher. Yeah. So Godcatcher actually ended up um, 22nd. Seven people have it on their team. On one of their teams. Uh, Becky Lynn's Straight Fire, I don't know if that actually showed up. Uh, let me do a really? quick, a quick, uh, because, nope, she did not show up at all. And, uh, Master Mold? Mm -hmm. Master Mold was number 15, 11 teams had that. Wow. Jubilee? I don't think that Jubilee showed up, but let me, uh, it's not in the top, like, 20 that I could see right now. So, uh, let me see, Jubilee. So, Fireworks was another one that I think we had mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, that one was 27th. Wow. Six teams have that. Uh, I have a question. So, yes. So, are more of the top cards in the top 10, are they more support pieces? We'll get. We'll let you know. I'll let you know. Okay. So X Men Field Leader is actually fifty sixth in the list. <laughs> All right. <laughs> three three teams have that on their uh, ones. So there you go. So our predictions were less than fifty percent. <laughs> wow. All right. Number one. Do you want to guess what number one was? Clayface. Yes. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Restless. Restless. Something? Yeah. Restless. Okay, just 26 restless. 26 teams have that on, have Clayface on so there. So almost everybody put Clayface on at yeah. least one team. Yes. Well, you can only put it on one team. Right. So 26 of 32 players put Clayface on their team. Yeah. Yeah, that does not surprise me at all because it's such a utility piece. And we didn't talk as much about utility pieces last episode as we thought we would. But Clayface allows you to take a die for the cost of a mask from your use pile and place it in your reserve pool on any energy face, which makes it very, very flexible. 
right? So looking at the, yeah, looking at the top 10, um, Thor is a main win condition, right? And uh, Becky is a main win condition. She can be, even though she's also like a control piece. Right. But all the other top, all the other ones in the top eight were all like supportive or some kind of uh, uh, control piece. She had Clayface number one, Mr. Sinister number two. Mr. Sinister, the rare that lets you field and prep psychics. You have to check the name for me. Dark Experiment Experimentation. Um, I think so, one? but I will double check. Hang on. Because I was not ready and I just typed TB and then it went to... <laughs> Some it TV went, website. It went to search <laughs> in the Google instead of whatever. So I was learning all about tuberculosis. See, I have it as you know, a bookmark. So, um, Mr. Sinister, yeah, yes, right. that is probably there for the global. Yes. Which is pay oh. two, field a sidekick from your use pile, and prep a sidekick from your use pile. Hope was number three, our favorite one, which everybody knows about. Pluripotent echopraxia. Yeah, I was waiting for you to say it because I wasn't going to say it. And you said you oh, do such a good on, job Kim, of you it. Can, you can say it. <laughs> I know you can. You can get there. It's not like a different language. <laughs> Pluripotent echopraxia. Hope Pluripotent Summers is the one yeah. that copies other X-Men. She's a three-cost shield and she copies the abilities of another X-Man. And what's unique about her is she retains those abilities until she is fielded again. So even if she is KO'd or removed from the field... She gets to retain those abilities. So sorry, yeah. So sorry, Mister Sinister is twenty-two on the team. Hope is twenty. Wow. And, yeah. Lots of X-Men's. And what has been Jocelyn saying the past couple of days? Hashtag and hope. <laughs> I have been not yeah. I, okay. In fairness, I have not just been saying that for the past couple of days. I've been saying that since she came since, out. Since the X-Men Forever campaign box came out, yeah. Since twenty nineteen yeah. worlds, I've been saying it. Hope, in my opinion, makes X-Men broken. And X-Men are broken enough without Hope being part of that conversation. Because you can get the ability of any X-Man for a three-cost shield. Mm -hmm. She is a little bit vulnerable, though. Because on her highest side, isn't she only a two defense? Yes. So she's really easy to actually KO. Or get rid yeah. of. So it is easy to get rid of her because she doesn't gain the stats of the other dice. Yeah. But she gains the abilities, which can be annoying. Because because she replaces um, the other card name with her own, if you have both of them active, if they're a while active effect or when fielded effect, you can double it because you have hope doing the effect. And then, for example, Colossus, Piotr doing the same effect right right which i have on one of my teams and because you mentioned it you know where he turned up where number 11 really people are all about that 12 teams have them so that's interesting to me because colossus is a reprint right Correct. so colossus piotr is the rare from dark phoenix saga he's a six cost fist when he was first out was he an avx kim Yes. I think it was AVX. AVX, and he was seven, seven cost. cost fist. Yep. Yeah, so yeah. they've reduced his cost by one. But while he's active, at the end of your turn, each of your level two or level three character dice deals your opponent two damage. So this is a blast from the past. This is a reprint. It's a redo. So people are going back to that old card maybe that they loved back in the day and redoing it. Or maybe they're new players that haven't used it before. Mm-hmm. I don't know, but that's interesting that that came in 11. Yeah. Uh, Typhoid Mary, rub, Red Rubber Boots, 16 people. That was number four, 16 teams. Mm -hmm. Talked about Thor. Number six was Dark Phoenix, the Destructive Force. You have to remind me which one that one is. Uh, and I had 14 on 14 teams. Destructive Force is yeah. the uh, rare. Okay. Is yep. that the one where she uh, gets damaged one? No, it's the... Yes. So when a opposing character die damages Dark Phoenix, she deals that much damage to each opponent. Okay. I'm surprised that people were going with her 
over the common malevolent that does four damage when you KO an X-Man guy. Yeah, and can you imagine how many probably X-Men teams are out there? Exactly. But I guess people are looking at the rare one as a attacker deterrent. Because if she's able to block, then if you attack with that 10 attack godcatcher, and she's able to block it for some reason, then um, she's going to deal 10 damage back to you. So yeah. it's an attacking deterrent. But at least she's a villain, so that means that Hope can't copy her. Yeah, actually, uh, it's a good thing, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well, Dark Phoenix wasn't really a, g a good superhero either, so. Well, you know, it's not her fault. I know. She I was, know. like, possessed, basically, remember? That's true. That's true. Like, the Phoenix Force took her over. It wasn't her fault that... It wasn't poor Jean Grey's fault. Poor Jean Grey. Poor super, Jean Grey. super powerful crazy mutant gets this extra Phoenix works power and becomes evil like no it's, it's not her fault it's not your fault she didn't mean to it was the phoenix force they took her over yeah just took blame over the, her brain blame the, blame the phoenix force yeah what are we on number seven which actually surprises me but i can get why it's just a little higher um was booker t the basic action ringside right. uh announcer yeah, so Booker T is the one with the global target superstar must block this turn if able. You pay a shield. Yeah. And then the actual action says all opposing superstars must block if able, and you may declare blockers for your opponent, assigning one per attacker until all attackers have been assigned a blocker, and then assigning the rest as you choose. Yeah, so 14 there, and then Becky was 13. So unless people are using, her, using that with Becky... Mm-hmm. Um, but an extra person has on the team, maybe. So, yeah, I was assuming maybe Becky, but it could be other things. Who knows? Okay, so does then, does Jerry Lawler come in next? No. Really? Jerry Lawler, uh, we'll get to see where it fell. It's not in the top ten. Okay. Uh, number eight would be Drax, the pacifist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fourteen teams as well. Gazer, yep. evil, familiar, which I'm pretty sure that's the intimidate one. Yep. So yeah, let's just let's just say teams. what Drax says before we go on, Kim. Yep. So Drax is the one that you choose an opposing character card, and that character die can't be purchased. 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 That's a fancy word. Purchased or fielded. Purchased. Purchased or fielded. Purchased. Um, I'm gonna stop now. <laughs> Until Drax leaves the field zone. Yeah. Okay. And then Gazer Evil Familiar is the intimidate one. He's the two cost yep. shield. And he intimidates something when he's fielded. Which means he takes it out of the field Becky. zone. Pardon? And then number 10 was Becky. Made in Ireland. Yeah. So, um, just for the Jerry. Global. Just for the global. So, Jerry actually came out to 35th. Really? With five people had it on T. So, how many people were playing Booker T? Uh, f 14. So that's interesting, and I am wondering if folks that are playing Dark Phoenix Destructive Force have put the Booker T Global on their team to force something to block Phoenix. Maybe, and then they're automatically taking that damage, and why not yeah. have it block the biggest thing they have there? Yeah, so you force the God Catcher token to block for the sake of argument, and even if Dark Phoenix gets KO'd, You've done Still 10 do damage that. to your opponent. Yeah. Yeah. So that can definitely, I can see that. Yeah. Go so it's interesting yeah. that most of that top 10, there were a couple of pieces in there that were win conditions and the rest of them were either enablers of win conditions like the Booker T or support pieces like Drax or the Clayface. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So yeah, so it was a lot of, um, yeah, support stuff, I guess, or control pieces or whatnot. Yeah, but that does make sense. Generally, I think you're going to find those pieces are the top because everybody has, has use for them, right? Yeah. Um, I know Iceman was another 
big one. Uh, was that right on schedule? Thirtieth, mm-hmm. five people have it on their team. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Green Lantern. Human. One hundred and forty fifth. One person has it on their team. <laughs> Did, was, were there any living the dream teams, Kim? Uh, living the dream. Living the dream. Living the dream. 125th on the list. One person has it on their team. Interesting. Interesting. I'm probably going to say none of Black Order came up or Nebula no. or Adam. <laughs> uh, no, no Nebula. What about my favorite hashtag, Spider-Man Forever? All right, ready? Spider-Man. You know he's on my team. He is. Uh, he's hit my favorite number on the list. He's 16th. I didn't know you had a favorite number, Kim. Yeah, 16 is my favorite number, actually. I use it for all my sports stuff and everything. And all my emails have 16 in it. Interesting. Yep. Yeah. Uh, 16. Hey, you learn something about me every day. Um, 10 people have it on their team. That's pretty good. Mm-hmm. So top that's a, 20. That's a third. Top 20. A third of the people put it on one of their teams. Yeah. Slightly less than a third, but I'm rounding up. So we so were what about okay. The mm-hmm. myst- what about the Mystique and the Black Widow agent? I can see. I don't see Black Widow being top here. I'm just looking at the page. Because uh, those are pieces that reduce damage by one, right? So Widow's Hunt was 26th. That's the spin down one, right? Yeah, that's the uh, rare from Infinity Gauntlet. Six people. Uh, Black Widow agent was 38th. Four people. I have that on one of my team. I'm one okay. of those four. And what about Mystique? Because the Mystique from the new set has also the does, same. Yeah. Is she called um, Freedom Force? She is Freedom Force, yes. Okay, so Freedom Force was 59th on the list. Three people have it on their team. So in total, seven people elected to put that put a card that reduces damage by one on their teams. Yeah. I was no. trying to fit Mystique on my second team, but I I couldn't get it. There just work. wasn't room. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Interesting. Well, that is really interesting. And then guess what, Kim? What's that? All of that information is going to change in a minute. <laughs> well, not exactly in a minute, but it'll By change come this. this comes out? Yeah. When this episode comes out. So it'll be interesting to see what the data will be before and after. So what Jocelyn's talking about is in this team, two team takedown, uh, we've added a, I guess a, a change um, that you could change one card per team after the end of round two. And then you can, you can still shuffle up the dice as you wish, uh, as long as you keep it legal to 20, um, but only one card per team. Yeah, and the reason you guys made that rule was because in the first two team takedown, which went the full five or six rounds, right? Five rounds, yeah. Um, there were some folks that realized pretty early on that their teams were not super effective and they would have liked to have had an opportunity to make a change. Mm-hmm. And as a result, I think some people dropped, right? Yeah, we had a few drops. Yeah. So the intent of this is for you to get your team out there try it out a couple of weeks, see how it's going, and then identify if you want to make a change. So it'll be interesting to see how these teams change when you can only change mm-hmm. one card. Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting. I don't... Yeah, I wonder if people add more control stuff, seeing what they've been playing up against, I guess. Um, but I know that Storm, that rare Storm, I don't know her name, Queen? Gosh, she's a queen, man. She is... <laughs> Is she the seven cost? Yes, that people are using hope for. Um, holy moly, she's uh, one to get around. I must say, it's I've come against her like in both my rounds, and I'm just like my head to just to get around to do things. It's, she's she's annoying. <laughs> well, she's got a lot of text, so yes, when fielded, and she has a lot going on. You re-roll target character die. And then when she attacks, you reroll up to two opposing character dice. And then you have each one that does not roll a character face 
to your opponent's use pile. Storm deals two damage to your opponent for each die it moved. And then if you happen to roll her on a uh, double energy face, she rolls energize, reroll target opposing character die. So she's all about rerolling those dice. Yeah. Yeah. And I, seven I guess... cost is very expensive for that. Uh, yeah, that's what people usually hope for. Um, and, and, hope. I, <laughs> and one person I know that I played against bought it. Bought her straight up. Yeah, um, I've purchased a Dark Phoenix straight up for seven before. Mm-hmm. If you have the right amount of ramp. Um, but with the amount of re-rolling she does, maybe seven does make sense. Um, but just seven just... There's just something about seven that seems like insurmountable. You know, like it's just like, that too much to reach for. Like it's just out of uh, reach. It's like when gas goes up to a dollar ninety nine nine per liter. I know it's crazy here. And you're like, it's almost two dollars. It's bad. You know, like last week I was driving and I was like, okay, if I see gas, I w- I'm going for under one ninety. That was my goal. A dollar ninety a liter. Well, I found it. I found one eighty nine one. It was last. It was last Sun Saturday, a week ago okay. Saturday. I was able to get uh, gas for one eighty nine one a liter, and in it really means nothing because if I paid one ninety one, I saved whatever eighty cents. Yeah, but there's like a psychological barrier, you know, to a seven cost, or to gas that's more than a dollar ninety cents. Like, how do you even call it cents at that point? It's a dollar ninety. Like, it's not cents anymore. Nope. Like, when back in the day when driving. it used to be like 40 50 cents, cents, and then yeah. you're just like 35. Oh my gosh, they got to put gas. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, not so anymore. Yes. But there's like a psychological barrier. That's what I'm getting at with a seven cost. But yeah, a three cost I... is too cheap and hashtag ban hope. I find it for you to get to a seven cost, you have to have like Cree and Dark Phoenix and just make sure you like prepped the turn before or something to do this. Like it's kind of crazy. It's doable mm-hmm. for sure. You just have to have the right, the right ramp engine. Clay face and all that stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. All of the things. So it yeah, takes so five things to do one thing. <laughs> That's super interesting, Kim. So um, can you give us a quick tournament update? How are you doing so far? Um, so we, I finished my second... We're in the second round now, but I'm finished my games. I played them recently. Uh, first game went really well. I went 2-0. and oh. Master Mold is kicking butt. Um, and then I got lucky on the sec- with my Colossus team, even though I had to deal with Storm rerolls and all that stuff. Um... But there was no control, so there's no like Drax or Typhoid Mary to really shut me down. Second game, uh, back up again, some rerolls. But again, Master Roll kick butt. Good old Master Roll. And um, I had two chances to win with Colossus, and I couldn't because I kept getting rolling out, and I missed a lot of my rolls, actually. So I missed Colossus Roll, Hope Roll a few times. Um, quite a few misses, so... Uh, that was unfortunate, so I went uh, one and two there. So I only won the one game, but lost. The so you're one two. and one at the end of two rounds? Yes. So, Kim, here's the question. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. Are you changing out any of your cards? Yes. Okay. And I'm changing not on the Master Mill team. I think that's uh, fine-tuned. Uh, I am changing one card out of the Colossus team. So what, what's the change there? What's the idea? So, ah, I can spoil it. I don't care. Um, so my Colossus team um, has uh, Moira on it. Um, it's the Moira. Now, I can't remember the name, but I will quickly find it. It's not Is a it dream. The common or the rare? Uh, the common. So it's not a dream. The one that uh, when an opponent feels a continuous action die, re-roll it. If it lands on action phase, they may field it normally. Otherwise, it goes to the use pile. So I really put it there for Godcatcher. Honestly, for just for Godcatcher, really. I'm not buying it. Unless I'm up against a Godcatcher team. Right. But I've found now that I haven't been up a Godcatcher team. Um, will I come up against it? I don't know. Uh, what, what was Godcatcher on the list? Really low, right? I can remember now. Yeah, seven people have it. Seven out of 32. So, or 7 out of 64, 64. Teams, I guess, right? Yep. 
Um, so I dropped that card. And I had to choose between either... I was going with, do I put a Gazer on? Or do I put a Drax on? Or do I put a Typhoid Mary on? And the reason why is because my Colossus team... These guys need to sit in the field mm-hmm. at level twos and level threes, and they can't go anywhere. But the problem I'm having is storm or anything that rerolls my characters out, and it's causing me problems because then they can't sit there anymore, <laughs> right? They're getting rolled out, fifty-fifty uh, chance, but you know that's big, it's huge, yep. um, and they're going mostly in the used pile. So um, I need something to shut down their hope or yeah. there, or whatever that is. So um, I went with Drax just because he's cheaper. He's a three cost. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just a shut down, honestly, Hope, because Hope's doing all the work. Yep. Um, and make them go either buy that high cost to do the re-rolling or make them shift, and hopefully I'll get on track and, like, kind of get going. Um. So that's that's what I took out and put on. Well, I hope it works out for you, Kim. Me too, because uh, when I come up against that kind of, like, a role team with that team, I'm having a lot of trouble. Yeah. Well, hopefully it helps. Yeah, hopefully. I wish so, you all of the luck. In and watch what's going to happen is we'll, we'll watch round three, I'll face a Godcatcher team against it. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> That's the way it happens when you change things, right? Probably. And you can't even Drax a Godcatcher, so. No, but that's okay. Even though the card says a character. No, it says a a card, and then it says a character in the text. So it's yep. just bad text. So it's but... just broken. Yes. Yep. But, yeah, so that's so. my uh, that's my change. But I think the Master Mold is pretty fine. It's fine. So. No, your Master Mold team is great, Kim. I'm very proud of it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's doing well. And nobody sees it coming, That my secret card. <laughs> my now secret weapon. Go look at your team, Kim. I know. My secret weapon. See if you can figure it out. <laughs> no, it's super smart. I'm I'm impressed. You did a great job building that team. Yeah. Who thought I, would thought I was going with Master Mode, but I did. Actually, I'm having fun playing with Master Mode. People always think it's, like, gross or whatever. And look, it didn't even come up in the top ten. But... <laughs> Well, I think some people don't like playing with proxies. Yeah, that could be and it too. I know that proxies are not great for, well, they're not permitted in official events. But some people don't have the Dark Phoenix cards yet, so I think they've elected not to play with them. Yeah. We'll probably see more Master Mold when Dark Phoenix finally gets to Europe. Yeah, yeah, but it is a hard, uh, again, a hot card to get because it's like hundreds of dollars to buy if you want one, so. Supply and demand, baby. I know, I know. So. All right, yeah. so let us know what you think of what we've shared with you so far about the top 10 Dice Masters two-team takedown cards. Were you surprised? Were you completely on board with that was what was going to happen? What were your thoughts? What win conditions are you playing? And how is it going for you? We would love to hear all of those things, wouldn't we, Kim? We would. Excellent. So, before we jump into the end of the episode, I guess we should talk about uh, Dice Masters, where you can play it. Yeah. What's our upcoming events looking like, Kim? Our upcoming events, we have our weekly events at Weekly Dice Arena, Tuesday nights at 9pm, hosted by DM North TV. Um, not, yeah, I said 9 o'clock Eastern. <laughs> uh, Thursdays is Dice Fight. Uh, at 4 o'clock Eastern, um, that's run through the Discord, and we'll always plug the Discords in our show notes, so look out there for those links. Um, and I believe Dueling Grounds, David is having something come up. He's doing something probably in the end of May. So just check out that channel under Dueling Grounds to see what's going on. Um, and uh, Dice Social is happening on Saturday, May 21st. Uh, 2 p.m. Eastern um, over at DM North TV, and we are doing a Hellfire Gala theme. Fun. Yeah. Um, so we'll see how that goes. It was taken from uh, Jordo, who did it locally at his uh, gaming group. So um, we're doing the same thing. Awesome. Well, that should be really fun, Kim, and I hope that everyone comes out for that. I will not be able to participate in that one as I will be getting ready to head off on my two-week vacation. 
but no worries. We will continue to record for you and we will not miss an episode. So um, there's one other exciting piece of news, Kim, about Dice Masters. Have you heard? Something about a, a con. That's right. <laughs> so Gen Con has put out their event listing. And Gen Con, which is being held in Indianapolis, Indiana, in August, will be holding Dice Masters draft events. So there isn't anything listed about any competitive level events for Dice Masters. There are some competitive level events that have been announced for Hero Clicks, including the U.S. Nationals. Um, but for Dice Masters, all that's been announced at the time of this recording is draft events for the most recent set that is available in August. So I'm going to guess that it's probably going to be Kryptonite. But probably. Who knows? Yeah. So if you're going to Gen Con and you're looking to roll some dice, there will be an opportunity for you to do that. Cool. But they didn't say what draft, though. No. They they. If you go to the Gen Con website, it's a little complicated. I took a look at it. Oh, okay. Um, I think you actually have to register, like create an account in order to look at the event listings. But you don't have to buy oh. anything to look at the oh, event, event, event listings. And then it lists all of the events, and there's like thousands of events. But you can filter them by company or by game system or just by typing in keywords. Dice Masters, if you're looking for it, is all one word when you're typing it in, FYI. <laughs> No space okay. um, from personal experience. <laughs> I took a look just <laughs> out of curiosity. Um, so they are listing uh, Dice Masters Rainbow Drafts using the draft packs there. So if you're at Gen Con, you're looking for some Dice Masters, there might be some people to play with. So that would be cool. Yeah. Hopefully so people go have... and play Dice Masters <laughs> and many other games like Hero Clicks and other things. So many. Games. Oh yeah, Heroclix is doing that. Yeah, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, so yeah, so that's uh, I think it for events, Kim. Yeah. So on that note, we would love to hear from you. So you can reach out to us in a myriad of different ways, which include email at triple D podcast at dm north.com. You can find us on all the socials, which include Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at DM North TV. As Kim mentioned earlier, that we do the. Uh, Dice Social on Twitch. You can find that on twitch.tv forward slash DM North TV. And you can also find our episodes as well as other videos on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash DM North TV. Uh, Kim also referred to our Discord. So the DM North TV Discord link will be in the show notes. If you're not a member, you can join us there. And if you're participating in the two team takedown, then you're absolutely there because that's the only way you can participate. Uh, you can also find both myself and Kim on Discord. Kim is at Super K and I am at Joss Stitch, J O C E Stitch. So until next time, on a double, double and dice. <laughs>